Sorry, I forgot about that part. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria, and everyone went to his own town to register. So Joseph also went up <clears throat> from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and the line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth, birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace to men on whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child, and all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. Uh, every year we would conspire together to decide uh, what we were going to ask for for Christmas. Our biggest disappointment uh, up until I was 11 years old uh, was the year I was eight and Rich was nine and we asked for horses. <laughs> and we were dead serious. We lived in a semi-rural area. I actually was a substitute teacher one year, which I've shared with many of you before here at Garnet Valley. And uh, it used to be in the school handbook, wasn't that many years ago, 
that students were not allowed to bring their horses onto the school grounds after school. That was a problem at Garnet Valley. And uh, we lived in a town that was like that. There were folks who had farms and horses and so forth. So uh, uh, we had a garage behind our house. And um, you know, at our age, we just couldn't figure out why our parents weren't excited about turning one of the garage bays into a stable. And uh, we would have two horses. And if they couldn't afford two, we would take one and share it. We gave them that option. They weren't about to take it. Uh, but we, we had faith right up till the final moment, because every year, whatever we asked for, my father said no. In fact, even before we got the sentence out, he would say no. And in most of those years, we ended up getting what we asked for. But right up till the last moment, we were in a state of suspense. So uh, there was a little bit of us as we came down the stairs that Christmas expecting to see horses. What we saw were a bunch of small gifts, some for him, some for me, some for our older brother and sister underneath the tree. No horses. Although, after everybody had opened their gifts, my parents said, there's something special for Rich and John out on the front porch. And uh, we went out on the front porch, no horses. What there were were English bikes. Do you remember when we used to call three-speed bikes English bikes? Uh, that was uh, Sandy shaking her head. You Marple Newtown girls, you just don't know anything. But we got our own bikes. And for us, that was a big deal, because we got hand-me-downs. Our bikes were our older brother and sister's bikes. And because I was the baby, I had to ride a girl's bike right up until that year, third grade. And out there were our own brand new bicycles. It got us over the disappointment of not having the horses. And it was a lot easier taking care of a bike than it was to take care of a horse. Well, a couple years went by. I was in the sixth grade. And uh, we were no longer asking together for what we wanted. My brother wanted a 16-gauge bolt-action shotgun. He was serious about hunting. He was also serious about getting into trouble almost every day. And my parents recognized that uh, he was not ready to have his own gun. Uh, and they kept telling him that. They did everything that they could to prepare him. And uh, you know, we just always assumed, they're just giving us a hard time. They'll get it for us. But uh, I didn't want a shotgun. And I didn't want to follow it up with a 22, which is what he was going to ask for for his birthday. Um, we had an old flexible flyer sled. It was a hand-me-down. And every snow, it was my older brother's, we would take it out. And after one run, it would fall apart. We held it together with screws. We put nails in it. We just couldn't make that thing work. And we always had to jump on someone else's back and go down the hill with them. So I decided I wanted my own sled, a flexible flyer. How many of you had a flexible flyer? It was like having the Cadillac of sleds. And I was hoping my parents could afford to buy me one was years later that I realized that the 50s were a very prosperous time. I don't know why everything was so hard to get for my parents. It really wasn't, but boy, they made it sound like it was really hard. But I was hoping I would get a sled. Now, I was 11 years old. I was about this size. And I figured if I got the sled, it would be about that size. I came down the stairs with my brother. We might as well have been twins. We did everything together. And we kind of creeped down. 
and Rich is looking all over for a shotgun. He's still looking for that shotgun. <laughs> Actually, he did get it the next year. I looked across the living room, and here was this sled. It hadn't been dulled as it is now. I kind of reconditioned it. We now put it out on our back deck as a decorative item during Christmas. It's been a long while since I've gone down a hill in this baby. Uh, but I looked at it. I had never seen a sled that big. We think it was the first year that Flexible Flyer came out with a five-foot sled. It was gigantic. And I think my mother had a bow wrapped around it, and it was sitting right up against the front door. I couldn't believe it. I just kind of stood on the other side of the living room and looked, waiting to have someone say, that's for you. I didn't want it to go to my sister or older brother. It was the best sled I had ever seen. How many of you have ever received something that was more than you would have ever dreamed or asked for. I think that's why I kept this baby. Now, if you're really romantic, those of you who are married will go home tonight and say to your spouse, you were more than I ever dreamed of or asked for. And that's why you see the verse in the bulletin tonight. We were at a prayer meeting probably about two months ago. And we were talking about something in regard to our prayer time here. And Dee and Marcia knew this verse, but they were trying to piece it together from Ephesians. Now unto him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us unto him be the glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages world without end. Amen. Exceedingly abundantly. That was the kind of language my mother used. And you'll notice that with this verse in your bulletin, it says KJV. The reason Dee and Marcia were having trouble bringing this to mind is that they had a mixture of the King James Version when they were young and uh, high school kids that they first memorized this by, and they were looking in their New International Version Bibles trying to find this verse, and they were having trouble finding it. I remembered it very succinctly because my mother put a part of it in the fly leaf of this Bible that she gave me. And she put a little note in it. My brother and I had been teasing my parents for years about the fact that we existed. And I've told you before, the first litter had already arrived. My oldest brother, who was nine years older than me, and then my sister, who was three years younger than him. That was supposed to be the family. Any of you have one of those families? Well, then the war ended. My sister was born just before the war. Five years later, surprise, my brother Rich came along. And that was kind of entertaining. I'm sure my parents were thinking, well, I wasn't really planning on that, but this will be fun. Five months later, my mother found out that she was pregnant again. And when we were old enough to understand these things, we would kind of tease my mother and father about this. And at first, she would get all defensive. And she'd say, no matter what you think, we really want it, you guys. Oh, come on, Mom. We were accidents. Rich may have been a nice surprise, but let's face it, Mom. I was a tragedy. 
And she, she would actually get very embarrassed about all of this and make all kinds of apologies. And then I graduated from college, and she gave me this partial Bible. This was from the years before the living Bible became a whole Bible, and Ken Taylor kept putting it out in parts. So this was living Psalms and Proverbs with the major prophets. And she gave it to me as a graduation gift from college. And here's what she wrote in the flyleaf. I've never forgotten it. To John, with much love and much gratitude to our Father in heaven for his goodness to us when he made us parents. Oh, boy. Then he always has been giving to us with exceeding abundance. And you were his exceeding abundance to us. Well, that was a lot nicer than being thought of as an accident. I've never forgotten that. I've kept this old partial Bible all these years just because of that note on the flyleaf. And you know, that's what happened on that first Christmas morning. God could have done a lot of things to rescue us, but he chose to become a human being himself in the Son, Jesus Christ. More than we would have ever dreamed of or asked for. Better than a horse on the front step. A little baby in a manger in whom dwelt the fullness of God. I hope even in the freezing cold, even as you're kind of on tippy toes looking over at Bud and wondering if he knows who won the Eagles game, I hope that the thrill has not gone away. This sled is always a reminder for me that when God gives, he gives with exceeding abundance. And oh my, what a gift. Let's pray. We thank you, O oh Lord, for the gift of the Son, for Jesus, who has not only come to us, but he has died for us. He has risen again for us. And in a way that is so mysterious that sometimes we have difficulty understanding it, he actually, through his spirit, lives in us. And through the gift of the Son, you are actually in us, and we in you. We pray, O oh Lord, in the year to come, as that light continues, to shine in us, that we will understand more and more the glory of what that is all about. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to proceed to the candlelight part of this deal here tonight, but